All right. Hi, everybody. This is John Jay. It's uh, March 21st, and um, appreciate you all joining. I'm with uh, aceofcoins.club. My partner Jim's on here. We're going to be talking about something very extremely boring, but very useful. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about some clients, <clears throat> because this is why I'm talking about this stuff. And hopefully it'll benefit each of you. Aceofcoins.club is a video membership area where much of the content, the technical information and documents and things of that nature are there. And I'm teaching you the concepts and strategies. And it's not just about registering an LLC or using a trust. Trust document. Okay, documents don't protect people. So aceofcoins.club, I'm using that to really to educate people on how to use some of these strategies we're discussing on these calls, many of which are you know published on YouTube and Brighteon and Rumble. And then on aceofcoins.com, we still have that where if you want me to set something up, there's a fee for that. And we we work that out. And you can go to aceofcoins.com. You can schedule a call with me. You can also order things, services, and whatnot. Uh, last week, I believe we were talking about Financial Crimes Network and how that kind of blew up in the faces of the financial crimes creatures. <laughs> FinCEN is what we call them. So I'm not going to go into that too much, but that's from last uh, week. And I know I have... Uh, the two recordings from March 7th and the 14th, and I haven't published those yet because I do want to make some edits on those. So I'm sorry for the delay on that, but I will publish those. It'll be on Telegram, and I think I might even actually make them available on YouTube unless I just cut out parts and make them on YouTube. By the way, you guys are welcome to change your name here. You can change your name, your ID. You don't have to show your photo, whatever you guys want to do. is fine with me. Um, now, after this call, we have, I have an interview with Michelle Melendez from uh, Blossom Inner Peace, Blossom Inner Wellness. I'm sorry. And it's a YouTube channel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that later, but uh, that's at uh, 8.30 Eastern time. I'll send you guys the link to her live uh, uh, presentation. You can, you can join if you want. But for right now, I want to talk about some technical aspects and I want to give examples of some of the clients I've been talking with this past week. So... One example is a, a client was nice enough to schedule time with me. And this is, these are clients from like, you know, several years. So it's nice when they stay in touch and they let me know what's going on and they still have questions. So anyways, so this one gentleman was, we had a you know, half hour discussion and he says, oh, by the way, I just want to thank you for recommending that instead of paying my credit card debt, that I use the money that I would have paid my credit card debt. I used that money to invest it. And he did, he invested it. And I don't remember exactly what he invested in, but it created for him enough cash flow and built up his net worth so that he was actually able to quit his job. So he was able to quit his job because instead of paying off his credit card debt, right? And that's really negative return on your money. I know it's, I'm not trying to be, you know, like friendly with the creditors unless it's your grandma. Okay. But if it's a, a stupid bank, those guys didn't risk anything anyways. Besides, even if they did risk something, uh, they're suited to take that risk, okay? If it's your friends or family, pay them back. If it's your doctor, pay them, okay? Don't pay the debt collector. Excuse me if I drink a little bit here, coffee. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, the credit scores, I mean, we can talk about that too. But so, so anyways, this is another example of someone who did really well by just simply, instead of paying off a liability that doesn't return anything, maybe he owed it, maybe he didn't, I don't care. I just want you to have the power to decide if you're going to pay. He made a choice. Instead of paying off unsecured debts so he could sleep better at night, I guess, he took my advice and went and invested that money, and it turned out for him. Now, if you are diligent, it probably could turn out for you well if you are following some basic principles. Don't think that you don't know enough that you cannot buy a liability or buy an asset, okay? Don't believe that you just are stuck in the world of only being able to pay off your debt and keep your job. I think that's just being afraid. You don't have to be afraid, okay? Especially if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, come on, take some risk, okay? And that's what he did. So his bragging right is now he can, he has quit his wage job. And he's able to live off of his net worth. And the moment he made that decision to allocate his cash towards something that, albeit, is some kind of a risk, instead of a known risk, a certain risk, paying off old unsecured debt, his net worth went up, even if he failed. You see? His net worth went up. And I'm going to talk about that in this call. And maybe Jim can help 
me or bail me out because I am talking out of school. I'm not an expert. I think Jim is an expert on accounting or math or something of this nature. Now, the way I look at the way I use these concepts is more of a general nature. So if I'm looking at two things, I might look at something in terms of, and I'm going to introduce some terms here, gross rents, or the technical term is maybe net present value. And they're related, uh, gross rents, net present value, gross rent multiplier or capitalization rate, cap rate. Okay. Things of that nature, things you might use in real estate. I'm not, no expert on this, but I look at the time value of money. For example, the discount rate. If I buy a tax lien certificate, there's a discount rate. My discount rate is where I'm going to make my money. Okay. The moment I buy is where I make my money. Not when I sell. You've heard that before, but I'm going to get into that in just a second. So Jim, you can interrupt me, man. I know I'm going to screw it up, but I just want to give you guys the concept. Um, and I'm going to share a screen here if I can do this right. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, let's see. I'm not going to go there. Okay, just give me a second because I'm going to switch pages. All right, I'm going to start with this. So what I wanted to introduce to you was this concept. Okay, this gentleman did this and his net worth went up and it even, he succeeded. So he was able to live off of it. Now I'll give you another story, another example. And uh, let's see when I do a share screen. I want to make sure I get the right one. Uh, okay. Let's do this. Sorry for the delay here. Sometimes I'm a bit slow. Here we go. So anyways, I just want to share a screen with this. Hey, it's Wikipedia. Okay, you guys can figure this out. Net present value on Wikipedia. So the other story is a gentleman, and I'm I'm not trying to bash somebody. I just, in fact, I kind of berated him. <laughs> but I want to be your advocate, okay? I, I'm going to be a little harsh sometimes when I talk to people, but I really, really want you to do well. And uh, so I'm sorry if that's, you know, if that comes across that way. But um, sometimes you just can't be nice because this is money and it's important. And your property and property rights are important. So what happened was this gentleman apparently owed the IRS $100,000 and uh, they were garnishing his paycheck. Well, you only make so much money, right? So the garnishment was like, I think it was like, maybe it was 20%. I don't think it should be 20. It could have been 10. It should be 10. If it's not 10 and you're filing returns, you can make it 10. There's a way to deal with the IRS. But for some, I mean, for, for, him, for himself, I think maybe it was too much stress, I suppose. So he decided to pay the entire $100,000. So what does that look like in terms of the use of capital compared with the other gentleman I explained where he took the cash and, and instead of paying off the debt, because the IRS debt is unsecured also, whatever. I mean, so the one gentleman went and he had a wage garnishment, but then he decided to pay off the 100000 principal. Now, I look at it like this. The wage garnishment was a heck of a payment plan. I mean, if he ran the numbers on it, the interest rate was probably far less than his credit cards. But he didn't like that for some reason and wanted to pay it all off. So what if he did what the first guy did? What if he took 85000 and put it into a duplex as a down payment or something, right? Or did some staking on cryptos. I'm not saying speculating cryptos because buying cryptos for investment isn't for everybody. It's not usually an investment for most people unless you're in staking. That might be an investment, okay? But uh, I'm just saying, he really destroyed the net present value of that capital. And so that's why I have this up here. Jim, what do you think? I mean, did I give you something to work on here? <laughs> Could you comment on net present value? Yeah, absolutely, sure. So yeah. net present value is, is a, a thing that you deal with every time, every day of your life. So it, it states that if you had $10,000 today and you had 12% inflation, in one year, that ten thousand dollars is worth eight thousand nine hundred twenty nine dollars. So, um, if you in five years that same ten thousand is five thousand six hundred seventy four dollars. In ten years, it's worth three thousand two hundred dollars. So, it's basically taking the cash value that you might receive in the future, and when you bring it back based on an inflation rate, um, and twelve percent is is considered what, what accountants use all the time, even though it's probably not close to real. So, if you were going to get um, you know, eight thousand nine hundred dollars a year from now, that would be worth ten thousand dollars to you today. So that's what you'd get today if you had it. So it's just a matter of pulling the cash flow back into current dollars. So it's just it's it's, it's making the um all of the predictions and all the things that you have based on the assumptions that you're making 
and gives you the current. So you you can change it and you can say, okay, well, what if it was a a five percent inflation rate? And then you can do, you, you can do that number as well. And so ten thousand dollars today's would be worth nine thousand five hundred in five years from now. It'll be seven thousand eight hundred. Ten years would be six thousand one hundred. So it basically pulls accountants use this to look at projects and pull the cash flows back in the current period, determine what's the best course of action to have. Does that make so sense? That, yeah, thank you, Jim. And so am I correct in saying that like if I'm looking at this formula here, the the, the subscript T is the time period that the accountant's working with and the I yeah. is the interest rate? Yes. They kind of plug that in, right? And the, so yeah. it's an algebra, don't get scared. <laughs> hey, guys, if you don't like algebra, maybe you like software because you know what? Someone else wrote the algorithm into some software and you could just click some keys, right? <laughs> I mean, you can go to <laughs> bank, you can go to bankrate.com and do an amortization on your mortgage. <laughs> right. You don't need to know the exactly. algorithm. There's a bunch, if, you, if you Google it real quick, you can you can go through the process and you'll, there's like 75 different calculators that are out there. There's already kind of all kinds yeah, of people that are out for there. Free. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's a place that I, the place that I go is called wesleyan.co.uk. Okay. It's savings and investment inflation calculator. How do you spell that? It's Wesleyan? W-E-S-L-E-Y-A-N dot co dot U-K slash savings and investments slash inflation calculator. Nice. That, that's, I think, really helpful. And so this is a really technical thing, but just understand there's a better use of capital. I mean, just generally, I didn't tell this guy, my first client, I didn't tell him any of this stuff. I just said, look, don't you think it makes sense that if you put cash into a known liability that you're not going to get anything else going forward? Whereas if you, it, in fact, if you didn't do anything with it, you'd come out ahead. But he went and put it into something and actually it changed his life for the better. And I didn't have to go into all this technical detail. It's just, you know, basics. But if you want to nail it down, like, for example, if you're looking at something like, let's say you're looking at, hmm, should I get into this real estate deal here or this other real estate deal? Or should I get into this real estate deal and this other business opportunity joint venture over here, right? So if I get some of these numbers, I can decide what makes sense, which gives me into this next thing. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop over here to what is the rule of 72, right? It's a very simple concept. Simple way to estimate the number of years it takes an investment to double in value at a given annual rate of return. It's calculated by dividing the number 72 by the annual rate of return. So it gives you some examples here, you see? You can do that on site, right? If you're looking at a, a piece of real estate, okay? You're standing there in the front yard with your agent. You can do that. You got your phone, right? <laughs> you can do that. So you can compare deals. In fact, that's how you make an offer, right? You decide what you want to make, what your risk tolerance is, what you want to make, and you run the numbers backwards and see if see what offer you're going to make to the seller based on what you think you can make on the on the property, right? So there's all kinds of ways to use this stuff. Another thing is gross rent multiplier. So a lot of this information comes from real estate investing, but you can use this for buying a website. Uh, I don't know that I would use it for anything that doesn't produce cash flow, though. I don't care about precious metals. I mean, you could, but precious metals isn't really going to increase your net worth. It's more of like an insurance against the loss of d buying value, buying power. But thank you, Jim, for that. It's really awesome. Yeah. So that's what I want to share with you guys. I mean, we can we can do some questions and answers and whatnot. Um you guys can look this up. Now, I had a problem, ironically, when I was searching on rule of 72, it kept giving me this, I was using SwissCals.com and I kept getting a message saying, can't find it. This is really weird because it's one of the most popular things on the internet, really, just like algebra, okay? So I actually had to go and uh, work hard and I found Forbes here. So there's some, there's some examples, but I just had a difficult time finding anything on Wikipedia for rule of 72. But anyways, you see it here and you can find it. Gross rents, gross rent multiplier, net present value, things of that nature. Um, anyways, so you got that. I want to share with you the 8.30 call, and then we can maybe do some questions and answers. I know that was kind of brief, but hey, what else can I say on that one? I mean, I could probably make up some more stories, recall some stories. Um, but anyways, this is what this is Michelle's site, and we're going to be on there. I'm going to talk about the FinCEN thing on her show because we haven't done that yet. So I'm going to put this in the chat. For you guys but here it is blossom inner wellness on youtube and then click on the live link and you'll see her she'll probably have something up there pretty soon uh the call starts at 8 30 so it's about an hour from now 
All right, and I'll put this on the chat thing for everybody. All right, so um, I just just keep that in mind, okay? Make the best use of your money, best use of capital, right? Before you pay off unsecured debt, or let's say, for example, let's say I've got cash and it's easy to buy a house. Some people that, you know, or buy a car. Let's say I'm going to buy a car, right? And I got 50000 in cash and I buy a car. Well, maybe it's easier to pay the 50000 or buy the car. And so I do that. And then shortly thereafter, maybe within the first month, I'm going to borrow against the car. I'm not going to get a title loan at a pawn shop. That's going to be too expensive. I'm going to go to the bank and get a real car loan to refinance my car because I can take $35,000. Let's say I, pay, I paid fifty for the car. Maybe I want to finance $35,000, right? Maybe $25,000 because I can take that money and do something with it. I can make some money. I can buy two websites, maybe. All right. So think like that. Instead of thinking about how I can not pay the IRS or how I can pay less for something, think about how you can make more money or make a better use of your money that you have control over right now. Anybody want to talk about something? I'm open to answer questions that are not on that subject because I know it's kind of technical. And luckily, I got Jim as a backup. So if you guys want to throw a technical one at me. <laughs> so. So on, on Blossom Inner Wellness, we're just going to talk about the, the FinCEN. I mean, I could talk about that now, but uh, I did last week and we can make fun of them, but the whole thing blew up in their faces, okay? FinCEN's regulations were ruled unconstitutional. And that was by a trial court, but still. Yes, yeah, student loans are unsecured. However, um, they are probably, I'd say, worse than the IRS because student loan, DOE, can levy on property without judicial oversight. So they're like the IRS in that sense. And yeah, they, they can't be bankrupted out. You can't exhaust them. You're just stuck with them until they're paid off, okay? And they just add interest and stuff like that. So if I'm talking to somebody that's got student loans and, and he's he or she is a younger person, like in his 20, mid-20s, I'm going to show them how to create or acquire an asset, some sort of cash flow mechanism that they can use to pay off the student loan, right? And so the idea there is if I show them how to make two grand, uh, two grand a month with owning a website and spending an hour a week managing it, or maybe I'm o overstating that. Maybe it's five hours a week managing a website. He's not, he doesn't have to get another job, but he's able to pay off that student loan without working for that money. Right? Well, if he learns how to make two grand a month, it's the same thing to make 20 grand a month. So did he go to college to make money or did he go to college to what? Learn to be an expert in something? No, he went there to make money. So when he comes to me, I'm going to show him how to make money. Greg? What did you want to? Yeah, I got some um, rental property that's free and clear, and I was wanting to do some of the equity stripping. And um, I downloaded some of those forms from Fannie Mae with the mortgage yeah. and everything. Right. And you talked about sometimes you will file a note along with it, and sometimes you don't. I was wondering. What I usually would be don't the... record the note. I keep a note. That way, so sometimes the client may not contact me if he has a problem, like someone that wants to challenge it. And so far in 30 years, no one's challenged anything because I use government forms. So I do a mortgage lien, but I give the client a note because that's a complete service. He's paying for that, right? Okay. Um, and the reason being is you should have a note. If there's a mortgage lien on the property, there needs to be a note instrument. It's just the proper thing to do. And so when you when you write up the note instrument, on the mortgage itself, you don't need to do the calculation for amortization. But on the note, there should be an, uh, there's an item on there that gives you the monthly payments and the interest amount. To get those, you have to do an amortization. And you just use the software like uh, amortization calculator on the internet. Right. <laughs> yeah. So basically just use the LLC that we've got for um, crypto use and and use it as the uh, lender. That's correct. That's a, a good use of it. You have an LLC that's being used for a highly liquid property like bank accounts and crypto accounts, then make it the lien holder on a mortgage on your real estate. Yep. Okay. And just fill out that Fannie Mae form and, and file it in the court. And that's pretty much all there is to it. That's all you do. Just slap the property description in there, go through the whole document, make sure it's consistent with your what you're doing. And yeah, you don't have to change pretty much anything. You just put in the put the amount of equity that you're trying to protect 
and then you just record the lien. Just keep in mind that let's say, let's say your property today is a hundred thousand and you put a hundred thousand dollar lien on there, which is reasonable. You put a lien on there for the total amount of uh, equity. That's reasonable. Also that is reasonable. Plan. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also you can go less. Now, sometimes you can go a little bit more, a little bit. And let's just say the property value goes up. Like you could sell it for $200,000 five years later. Well, the other 100,000 is not going to be encumbered in that first lien. So just be aware that if someone comes along and puts it like a judgment lien, he'll be second in line, but there's equity there, right? Correct. So yeah. if you can if you can modify that or refinance that mortgage before someone else puts a lien, you can cover that 200,000. So just keep that in mind. Right. Right. And now would probably be a good time to do it because uh, you know, values are pretty high and then you know, in a couple of years when they drop, they'll say, well, I got the loan back then. And, you know, it's way upside down. And you can refinance it. But yeah. The thing is, remember, if you release that lien, if there's other liens, all of a sudden you become the last lien holder. So be careful. Right. That's why a lot of times I just like transferring the title to a holding company. That way I don't have to deal with equity stripping and the valuation changes. Because we kind of understand what the valuation changes are, but I don't have to really manage too much if I just convey the title over to a limited liability company, for example, as a holding company. Right. Yeah. I'm just kind of in a spot where I'm wondering whether whether or not I can get insurance at this point. So why would I've you got, not be able to get insurance? Well, the houses are older and they're starting to get tighter on. Okay. On so conditions. there's a. I don't. I don't publish this too much, but there's a there's a thing you can do. Go go and look through the list of items on your property that you would need insurance. Like you want to offset the risk, right? Correct. So what risk is that? The risk uh, basically roof blowing just hurricanes. Off. For, okay, hurricanes. So roof blowing off, house blowing down, stuff like that. Okay, so you need coverage for that, but you don't need coverage for stuff you can just do yourself. You can you can put stronger windows. You could do double pane windows. You can even do bulletproof windows. That's going to give you some strength. You can even have your house inspected. I don't know if you can add hurricane straps in Florida, but something to think about. So you can you can reduce your actual risk that you're trying to get insurance for, and you can document this, and then you can shop around for a policy, and they might look at that and say, hey, that's a post-1995 structure, like in Florida. Right. You know, because after 19, after what, was the, what hurricane was it? I forget, 95 or 97, something like that. They changed the building codes mostly in Florida. If you can, if you can get a contractor to go through that, that may give you uh, the ability to qualify for, uh, you know, homeowner's insurance. Or better yeah. rates. When you do that much to your home, you almost don't need insurance at that point. <laughs> exactly. That's the whole point. I mean, I mean, if the risk is so low, why couldn't I just carry the liability myself? Right. right? Well, I've got a, a separate liability policy, but I'm just looking to cover the structure. You can cover the structure, but the, there's other thing too. Like maybe you don't care about the structure. Maybe if the house is so old and 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 you're not attached to it, right? And if it blows away, hopefully you're not in it. And you'll just get another one. No hard no, feelings, are, right? These are rental rental properties. Oh, well, okay, you know. there's that too. So, but yeah. now if you have important things like, uh, you know, uh, antiques, maybe you want a renter's policy to cover the contents, the chattels. You can do that if you're the right. property owner. Or you can get a rental rental policy. You'll you'll be covered. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that answered my question on the uh, equity stripping, and uh, that looks uh, pretty straightforward and easy to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you much. All right. Very, very good. Yeah. Uh, Steph, thanks for the comment. So yeah, if you, I mean, I, if you come to me with whatever situation, right, I will make you look poor and you will thank me for it <laughs> and you can build up your net worth however you want. And you're still going to look poor because I showed you how we do it. And so if you look poor, apparently from what Steph is saying, and I kind of don't care, but it's good to know this as you, I mean, it's going to be forgiven, right? So what, it takes 20 years to expire? Okay. Well, that's nice to know, and I kind of don't care, <laughs> right? If I'm if I'm protected, then who cares what the rules are and stuff? And great, if they're favorable to me, okay. If I have to be in that situation, I remember one time I, um, I, I stripped out somebody's uh, risk of wage levy. Well, I, I did all the paperwork, and he didn't file it. So he comes back to me like a year and a half later. And he goes, John, they're going to levy my check. I said, didn't we already fix that problem? He goes, well, I didn't file the papers. And I said, hold on a second. And I had to go look up the Florida statutes. And then I had to fill out. I should have done it. I should have charged him more. I didn't do that. But I had to look up the rules for qualifying for the exemption from the levy, which I did. And he qualified. And I got him out of it that, that way. So he got lucky in that sense. So, 
yeah, it's it's good to know the rules sometimes. I hate to have to look at the rules if I can just avoid the problem, right? Because remember, if you can avoid costs of litigation, that is, you can avoid having to pay attorneys and the risk of a judgment lien being executed against your property rights, well, then you, you won already, right? You don't have to fight. Avoid the fight. The save plan. Okay, well, that's nice. I mean, I hope that's something you can rely on, the DOE save plan. Freedom Law School. Okay, look, Paymon's a smart guy. I'm jumping from comment to comment here. I like Paymon. I met him in 2001 in Cancun. Um, you don't need to know all that stuff about the IRS. It's nice to know history, and he's probably way smarter than I am on knowing all that. And it's completely irrelevant because what I show people how to do is simply change your property rights to change your liability. You don't need to understand the history of the banking system in the United States, okay? Uh, if you want to learn all that, that's great. If you want to pay the money to learn it, okay, great. But that is not going to solve your problem. Sending letters and getting the IRS to agree with you ain't going to solve your problem. What will is your typical use of companies and property rights. That is, It's what you do with your property that's going to solve your problem. It's not trying to negotiate with somebody else or get someone to agree with you, okay? You've got to do it yourself. Switching to just hazard insurance, okay. Yeah, I guess so. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. They're only going to they're only going to get insurance like for example, catastrophic coverage. If I underwrite my own car insurance, which is what I do. I have a company that has precious metals and if, if they're liquid, right? So the government agrees with me. If I send an affidavit in every year, the government's going to say, "Okay, here's your registration. You don't, you know, I don't pay Geico or somebody for my insurance. I'm the insurer." The problem is if there's catastrophic, right? And chances are I'm not going to do something stupid when I'm driving. I'm going to be safe and chances are I'm going to be in the right of way and I'm not going to be the person that causes a wreck. And so far I've been right so far. Um, but there's always that catastrophic, right? What's to say that someone else is at fault and hurts me. And then <laughs> who's going to cover that? What if the other person can't cover it? Right. What if his insurance can't cover it? You see? So yeah. What do you do? Well, there's some risk that you don't want to take on. You probably shouldn't take on catastrophic is one of them. One of the ways I suggest, like for example, in healthcare, if you get healthcare insurance, Health insurance is what they call it. What are you getting? You're getting a bunch of quacks. They're going to sell you drugs, right? So how do we get away from that? Well, you can. You want to be able to decide who's going to help you if you're sick or you know get injured or something like that. Well, how do you cover catastrophic? Probably not with insurance if you want to avoid that system, right? So one way to do that is to set it off with credit, unsecured credit. That would be a good use of credit, money, credit, right? So if you need to, you can use your credit cards to cover maybe a quarter million dollars worth of something. Maybe you have $80,000 in credit. That should be enough to get you the care that you need in a catastrophic situation, right? Yeah. There's always going to be that hurricane in Florida. It's always going to be that, the one that wipes out a dozen trailer parks, I hate to say. <laughs> and so Paymon, P-E-Y-M-O-N. And I can't pronounce his last name. It starts with an M. Sorry about that. He's a nice guy, okay? He's very knowledgeable of the tax system. Um, I just don't like that he promotes that as a solution to a tax problem. I don't think that's... Uh, I think it's disingenuous. I think he knows better. We've had that conversation. Um, so anyways, yeah. I hate to say anything disparaging about people, especially when he means well. I mean, he really does mean well. I just don't think it's a way to solve people's problems. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't know that Dr. Stringer. Okay. That's interesting. All right. For equity stripping, what if the property is being used to secure a debt? Yeah. So what you're doing with equity stripping is you have equity that's still at risk, right? It's exposed. So you have a first mortgage and then you have equity. What you're going to do is file a second mortgage and take over that equity. You're transferring the equity from the title holder to the lien holder. That's what you're really doing is you're transferring equity. You're taking it. A lien is a taking of property, okay? Yeah, I've never had someone challenge it. Just just be reasonable. You know, try to do a, a lien that's, that's reasonable, okay? And you have every right to do that, by the way. There's no issue of fraud there. All right. Yeah, I mean, a million-dollar lien on a $100,000 house is of no consequence other than if someone were to challenge it, it looks uh, it doesn't look realistic, right? 
So sure, that's your risk there. Why would you do that? <laughs> Think it through. All right, so if you wanna ask me a general question about your credit score, pay your bills, right? If you pay your bills, <laughs> you can improve your credit score. Uh, I mean, you can, the system's a scam, okay? So let me just tell you real quick. There, What happens is, you have Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Everybody knows about those. They're interacting with consumers. They collect cons consumer data, all this stuff. But what people don't know is that there are other credit reporting agencies that are also regulated under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And those agencies, like, like LexisNexis, those are being used by these other three to validate claims on your credit. So if you have an adverse claim on your credit, like let's say you didn't pay Citibank, right? And Citibank says you're in default. And let's say Citibank sues you and gets a judgment. And so that's all valid. But when you when you dispute the item, the agency like Equifax will just simply ask trans, uh, not trans, but it'll ask LexisNexis, is this valid? Well, LexisNexis will have already collected that data. And of course, LexisNexis is gonna say, uh-huh, we have it too, just like you. Well, that is not really validating it, but hey, okay, we all know it's an accurate report. But let's say you want to get remove it from your credit. Well, if if you know that Equifax is validating with another credit reporting agency and they're subject to the same set of rules, why don't you just freeze your credit report with LexisNexis and then demand that it be validated? And when Equifax goes to validate it, LexisNexis is going to say, sorry, we can't help you. And so then Equifax does what? removes it from your credit because it's required by law because it can't be validated. <laughs> the whole thing's a scam, right? So that would be like one way to trick the system, right? Same with student loans, bankruptcies, all that stuff. All works the same. Loans are not taxable unless you don't pay them back or you get into a, like a, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, a new deal, right? You have new terms. A settlement agreement or something like that, and then you don't pay that, that can be taxable as what's called imputed income, right? So you can look that up, imputed, I-M-P-U-T-E-D. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So, so here's what I've done for like tens of thousands of people. What we do is they have unsecured credit card debt, right? And they don't pay it. And the creditor sends a 1099 because the creditor makes money whether you pay or not. That's why, you know, if you do a settlement with them and you pay half, you're really paying all of it because you made a settlement. So the settlement creates a tax liability. So what happens is the creditor sends you, just one second, the creditor sends you a 1099, okay? So a lot of a lot of you don't know this. You just report the 1099 for an unpaid credit card bill on your 1040. Did you know that you don't have to do that? There are two letter rulings that preclude you from having to do that. And the IRS knows this, they won't even challenge you. So if you exclude the 1099 from the credit card bill you didn't pay, provided that you didn't do a settlement agreement, the IRS doesn't care. What? Your accountant won't tell you that. There's two letter rulings that came out in the 90s. A letter ruling is something that it changes agency policy or practices or it brings it to light so people can use it. So one of the letter rulings says that you're not liable for, that would be an imputed income tax liability, the non-payment of a credit card bill. Uh, you're not liable for it if you're insolvent at the time. Well, most people are insolvent anyways. I mean, you can show you got a mortgage, right? Probably you can show you're insolvent. You have more debts than you have income, okay? You have to keep on working like in most people. Or that it was not the result of an unpaid settlement agreement. Those are the two letter rulings. Now, I've never looked to see those letter rulings. I just know that I've checked with different CPAs over the years and they confirmed it. I don't even care. I just know the IRS agrees with me and that's enough. So that's the story on that. Yeah, I don't know about this, guys. Okay. Yeah, so I don't want to go too far into that. Uh, but anyways, we're we, good accounting rules here, Mal. Thanks, 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 John. You always great accounting things, always tricks. Yeah, that. Yeah, I, I mean, I really want people to know some of these basic things. Um, just really look the time value of money. All right. Um, you can you can raise capital to do things. You know, realize that you, you drive through town all day long throughout the week, right? You're driving through town and you're passing projects and real estate and, and businesses and relationships, business relationships that exist where they were built by investors where the people that own those investments are not the investors. Other people are, 
or they're the investor, but they're using other people's money. And most investments, what I'm saying is most investments are made with other people's money. What we end up talking about, people that are under the net worth of, let's say, $3 million, typically we're talking about acquiring cash and then putting it to investment. That's not usually how investments are made just so you know. So what that tells you is the whole system is based on using people's other people's money. It's not a trick. You're not hurting people. You're actually helping people because there are people that have too much cash and they don't know what to do with it. You'd be surprised. They're looking for investments. If you can find something and you can start looking at these things, there's another reason to know net present value. Okay. If you can create a balance sheet on something on a, on a, let's say buying a car wash, I don't know why they're popping up all over here in Florida, but where I'm living, there's like five new ones in like the last year and a half. Uh, if you can go to buy a car, a car wash, let's say, and you can look at the balance sheet for the car wash and you can figure a net present value on it, right? Why couldn't you go to someone with some capital that doesn't know what to do with it uh, and, and show them, hey, look, I got this deal here. You want to get into it? Why wouldn't he? If he doesn't know what else to do with his money, right? You can't have that conversation if you don't understand that present value. What are you going to do? Hey, can I, Uncle Bob, can I have some cash? He'll be like, yeah, for what? Oh, I'm going to buy a car wash. Well, you got to show him something, right? I mean, yeah. So, yeah, that's another thing, too. I mean, you're going to help somebody out. If, if he's got the capital, he's either going to be taxed on it if he doesn't spend it, right, or not. So, so you're giving him a way out of the taxation if he's going to defer it by investing it somewhere. Anyways, you're not cheating somebody by using other people's money. Just take on a good risk. And the way you show it is by looking at a balance sheet and looking at the numbers, like a net present value. What's the time value of my money? If I put in a million dollars now, when do I get my money back? My partners and I talk about it all the time because we're always saying, hey, do this deal. Hey, do that deal. Hey, can you have 50,000 here? Can you send me 50,000, 100,000, you know, things like that. And they always ask, so when do I get my money back? Common question. So, yeah, what's up with aceofcoins.com? I just was there like two minutes ago and it was working. So, oh, because you're using a VPN? I don't know. I have to check that out. Jim, maybe you can either comment or just check it out because people want to look at my site with using a VPN. I think that's cool. And I know for yeah. years it was only based in the US. You got based in the US because of hacking. <laughs> so, I'm, we don't, we don't, so, if you're in like uh, Albania, you can't look at the site. So, based on where all, all of the uh, nefarious sites are, of uh, hackers are, we exclude a bunch of those things. So just go to a USA site, go to Chicago. Set your okay. VPN to Chicago if you're somewhere else and you'll be fine. Oh, cool. Thanks. I, I just learned something too. I didn't know that. <laughs> so I guess you have to you set your VPN. Yeah, because I can tell you guys the FBI is camping on my site and they're watching you when you read my site. I know they are. <laughs> Batman doesn't believe me. They're especially watching you, Batman. Okay, y'all. Well, I'm going to get ready for the next call. It's in 50 minutes on Michelle's site. And we're going to just bash the Financial Crimes Network creatures again. So I hope you'll join us. It'll be live feed. All right. And so I will oh, diligently. Thank you. Looking yes. forward to the replay of this. You know, I'm going to have to listen to it all over again. Thanks, Lane. And I know of all people <laughs> you're asking me, I'm so sorry for the delay, but I want to make sure I don't give you like, you know, a bunch of nonsense. I'd like to edit this time. So it's anyway. It's never a bunch of nonsense, but you talk <laughs> with the best. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. You know, I'm no, probably one of those people apologize. like if I watch, if I watch instructional videos on YouTube, it's 2X or 1.5X, right? If you guys watch <laughs> me, you're probably like on 0.75 or something, right? Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, Have John. Yeah, John. Just be just before you go. A yes. um, couple of questions. Uh, I'm from Australia, and okay. um, I'm wondering about the uh, use of Philadelphia and New Mexico in relation to a um, foreign-owned LLC. You mean registering a company in one of those uh, states, Pennsylvania? Yeah. Yes. They're good states. I like them because uh, they. The state itself doesn't interfere with your business. Uh, some of our states do, like California and Texas. So that's the reason why I prefer those two. Pennsylvania, you said New Mexico, right? Yes. Pennsylvania and, yeah, New Mexico. Those two states, um, uh, they're very easy to work with. And the banks, they understand. The banks will say, okay, fine, you register with those states, great. They'll open your account. Okay. Um, how does the – you talk about um, – 
Caleb and Brown. How is that used in relation uh, to the crypto trust? I like them best because they're they are truly uh, interacting with the, your interests in managing cryptos, unlike the state based exchanges or in Canada like Coinbase and Kraken, those guys try to frustrate you and then they delay your trades and all this new miss opportunity. With Caleb and Brown, they actually provide a platform where you can you can move money the way you want and actually make money with them. Okay, awesome. Um, I can't work out how to uh, go about paying for that uh, trust, that um, LLC trust. Well, uh, if you're in another country, pro we usually uh, use Zelle or PayPal. Uh, we can occasionally take Bitcoin, so just let me know. There's other options. Just put a note on the notes field. Uh, okay. Um, I could get um, bank account details for, for direct deposit, could I? You could do that. I think that, yeah. I think that'll work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, just, just in relation to that... Um, um, foreign owned LLC and the use of Wise and Revolut um, because I can't obviously get a, a bank account in the States. Is that going to be okay? Is it okay where to open an account? What? With Wise and Wise and Revolut because What's I won't that? be able to open an account in the States, will I? I don't know. You can you can use an LLC to open an account in the states. I don't understand. What's Wise and Resolute? Is that the name of? Oh, they're, they're 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 both online um, exchanges, banks. But can I actually open an account in the states without being present? Yes, you can. And the, and the, the the banks understand that some people do that. Uh, in fact, I just talked to someone from Canada who's doing that. Um, our clients do that in the states. Yes, just just work with the bank and. What my clients do, they don't even go into the banks. What they, what they've been doing for like fifteen years is they just uh, interact with the bank through the internet. Sometimes they have to call them, but lots of times they just upload the documents uh, through the portal. Okay, awesome. Yeah, just okay. ask them. They'll work with you. It's it's not as easy, but they'll work with you. Okay. Do you have a particular bank I could do that with, or? We have uh, types of banks here. Uh, they're called national associations, and they're big re recognized brand names like Wells Fargo and Bank of America. And we all hate them, but they will work. You know, U.S. Bank is another one. There's probably a dozen of them that you can find. They're national associations. They're known as NAs, right, as opposed to credit unions or state chartered banks. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And um, yeah, somebody put me on to you a week or so ago, and um, yeah, you've got some awesome information there. Um, okay, appreciate albeit, that. Albeit yeah. um, a lot, a, a lot of it, um, or the majority of it, um, referred to uh, in uh, for U.S. Uh, residents, but um, yeah, yeah, I'm some of it can be modified for other countries. Uh, we can use the concept of LLCs in other countries. I do that throughout Europe. Um, in fact, I've got clients in Australia and Canada that have used the LLCs. We can do them there or we can export them there. So there's things we can do. Also, the easements and all these things, they're very similar, especially for, you know, all the countries that have adopted the English system. Very, very similar. Okay. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks for the questions. Appreciate that, everyone. And thanks for your participation. And I uh, look forward to seeing you next time. And enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Happy, happy weekend. Same to you.